It is my pleasure to bring back Tony Dwyer. He is the market strategist with Canaccord Genuity. Tony, you were in here a few months ago. Um, you had an excellent presentation. I know one of the things that you talked about was uh, the fact that uh, you thought that there was plenty of reason for the Fed to turn more uh, dovish, um, namely that uh, uh, inflation had moved below their target level. And uh, that's exactly what's happened. I mean, we have seen the Fed now, uh, Jerome Powell testifying before Congress this week has indicated that the Fed is uh, prepared to act. Uh, that's helped lift the market today. Um, great call a few months ago. Hopefully you have some more uh, great information like that for us today. Well, thanks for having me. <clears throat> and I think it's kind of it's kind of rare in our game that you can have a, a kind of a unique call that's so f aside from consensus. And I think maybe four or five months ago, thinking that the Fed was going to actually ease was pretty well not accepted as the norm. And now, now clearly it's the norm. There's 100% probability of an ease priced into the market, into the bond market, according to um, uh, according to Bloomberg. So it's really hard to say <laughs> that uh, it's not going that way. And I, I like to remember that one of the, one of my, I was fortunate early in my career that you guys all know Marty Zweig, remember Marty Zweig, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Marty was very famous as a technician and fundamentalist, which is, a, which is me. And that's how I learned. He was very famous for two lines. Don't fight the Fed and don't fight the tape. And if you think about that, why isn't it follow the Fed and follow the tape? Because human nature is every time the Fed is easing, you want to fight it because there's something fundamentally seemingly wrong in the economy that's making the Fed ease. So I think one of the value adds I can have here before we go into a few slides is to understand what is the differentiator of, of a, why the Fed is easing and, why, and we called for it, not because there was some kind of economic catastrophe, clearly, there's a, sh a sharp slowdown in economic activity globally and now domestically, but that's supposed to happen after you get the kind of move up in rates that we had last year. And I think what people are missing or, or may be missing here, who knows, maybe I'm missing it and I'm totally wrong, but what people may be missing is just like those higher rates led to a slower economy today, won't the lower market rates lead to a better economy tomorrow, meaning over the next six to 12 months? And I think that's why the market is going up right now. Yes, bad news is good news because it means the Fed is eased, but the market rates have already done it. So let's get, let's get into it. Um, let's look at what happens to the equity market around the initial Fed rate cut. Um, and, and as you know, a lot of these charts that are, these are also up on DwyerStrategy.com, totally shameless plug that I'll give more than once. Um, but what's up, uh, we use a lot of Ned Davis charts because they do such a good job. But this chart, we had them look at what happens around the first Fed rate cut in a recession versus a no recession environment. This call, any call in the market from a macro perspective is binary now. It's not gray, you've already had the slowdown. Either you drop further into recession or you recover. And there's a big difference in how the market reacts relative to whether you go into recession or not, as you can see here. And history shows that the initial Fed rate cut you get a, in a no recession environment, you get a 24% gain, or as if you're in a recession, yes, it's positive, but it's mostly in the last four months. So um, from the last call, hopefully you guys remember that we did the 1995 analog where we thought that the environment both politically, economically, monetarily, globally, um, news driven, was very similar to 1995 and our bet was that you weren't going to go into a recession then and you were going to do Powell was going to do what Greenspan did. Don't forget in April of 1995 the Fed was still looking to raise rates twice that cycle. In July of 1995 they cut rates for the first time. Similar to the current environment you had that that pivot um, that nobody really expected that came from a, some pretty sharply slowing economic data. Remember, the Fed pivoted not after this last payroll report, but the one before it, meaning they started to indicate that you could have an actual flexibility on monetary policy after I think it was the, that would have been the May uh, payroll report. So um, again, what got me to going on those the chart before on this chart and this chart was there was kind of a bear narrative going around. They were showing you a 20 year chart of the initial Fed rate cut and it happened right before a 40% drop in the last two cycles. 
That's true. There's nothing inaccurate about that. It's also incomplete. I'm a big fan of looking at real hit all of history and not building a narrative around a certain piece of it. And, you know, you had a market at 30 times earnings that it had a massive decline in the advanced decline line going into the first Fed rate cut in 1990. And again, you had the same thing, uh, not the same thing. You had a financial crisis that hopefully will never be replayed globally in the banking system uh, in the la in the last cycle when you cut began cutting in 08. So, guys, I, I you know, it's just a very different environment. Um, this chart is a hell of a spaghetti chart, as you can probably see. Um, the point of it is when you look at that ver vertical um, da dashed line, that's the first Fed rate cut outside of a U.S. recession. All right, what, what do you notice happens on that? You get a drop immediately. You rally into it a little bit and then you get a drop. These are all the sectors, by the way. And then you kind of rip. And that's the that's the story that we're telling here is that not that I don't think the next I, I wouldn't bet my ranch that the next tick is higher. I, I think it actually is probably going to have a little bit of choppy behavior around an overbought condition that has a little bit too much bullishness around. So I could see things getting choppy, but ultimately don't fight the Fed and don't fight the tick. So our whole core fundamental thesis revolves around inflation and inflation expectation driving Fed policy. That drives the yield curve, that drives the economy, that drives uh, earnings, and that drives the market. You know, there's a lot of people that talk about what drives the market. The only thing, the thing that I find with the highest correlation, it's the direction of earnings, not the rate of change in earnings. And I'm, I'm working on a study right now that's very interesting, I think, which probably means nobody will read it. But um, it's interesting because the narrative is the out-year estimate is so high in the S&P that if it comes down like I think it will, who's going to pay more for lower earnings? And guess what? It doesn't correlate to the rate of change. It correlates to the direction of earnings, and that should remain positive. So what I'd like to do for the call, guys, rather than go through the whole slide deck, is really focus on inflation and how do you know whether it's a recession or not given uh, how the bond market's acting. So the Fed, even today, um, Powell's talking about inflation targeting, their target's 2%. If you're trying to get to an average of 2% and it's you've only been there for a, a nanosecond this cycle, don't you think they got it? They, they're getting more worried about disinflation than inflation. There are two main things they look at are core PCE and inflation expectations. The core PCE has dropped precipitously down to 1.6%, uh, right? It's, it's hard to make the case that you're going to get an average of 2% when you're at 1.6% without doing something differently. And what helps them do something differently, meaning ease, is this implied five-year inflation break even, which is at a 155, right? Which is suggesting five years from now, the market's pricing in inflation at 1.55%, um, pretty much where the current core level of inflation's at. So if these are your two key metrics that the Fed's watching. Yeah, the economy's okay. Yeah, there's full employment. I get that side of their narrative. But the one thing that I'm sure they want to avoid more than anything else is being Japan. We've got too much debt. You cannot fix debt with exponentially more debt, so they have to keep doing this. And you know that will bring up you know the, the other side of the trade, which I'm very familiar with. The other side of the trade will say, well, that's just inf inflating the bubble. You know, it's Fed induced. It's blah blah blah. Well, here here's my response to that. Yeah, okay. So what now? What? You know, the Fed has told you what they're going to do. I don't care if they're right or wrong. I know what they're going to do because they're telling us. If the guys printing the money are telling you they're going to keep printing the money, I could write all sorts of great think pieces about how they shouldn't that mean absolutely nothing to investing. Core inflation and inflation expectations continue to come down, right? It comes at a time when people are, the only real worry has been about labor inflation. Labor inflation on the bottom half of this slide, uh, page seven at, that you're looking at, is that's productivity, U.S. productivity output per hour. If you're worried about labor inflation, it's hard to get high labor inflation when you have high productivity, right? Because look at what drives productivity, unit labor costs, or, right? Or productivity drives unit labor costs. Unit labor costs are coming down hard. So if unit labor costs are coming down hard and core PCE follows that, 
It's hard to make the case in any way that inflation is about to have a significant uptick. I think they're more worried about disinflation than inflation. And how much should they ease? You got the 10 year at a 202 this morning. On this chart, it's at 201. It's at 202. The 10 year is below the lower bound of Fed funds. You don't need to be a Nobel economist to figure out something's amiss. So herein is where I will think I will differentiate versus my um, competition. I'm on everybody's same, we're all on the same page. Economic growth is decelerating sharply. That's been the story from some for not expecting upside market. As you know, from the last time we we're on, that is the bull story because it allows the Fed room to ease. The market is commanding them to ease more aggressively than people think. Um, this chart here is the heralded 210 yield curve. I love to, to actually check and see if I'm full of it. Um, so I went back and I looked at early 2006, the first week of 2006, I did a MythBuster piece on the yield curve and I used the 210 curve. So the 210 curve is what drives shadow banking. Shadow banking is what drives most of the growth in, um, in credit right now. So that's the one you need to invert. And actually today, after, after Powell's comment on Capitol Hill, it's actually bounced up to over 20 basis points. So it's actually, it's a pretty interesting day because you're getting a re-steepening of the yield curve, which is constructive. Guys, don't forget, your median gain in the S&P is 21% over 18 and a half months. After it's inverted, it has yet to invert. I get it. The three-month and 10-year has. I talked to the head of a bank and I asked him if he cares about the three-month, 10-year because that's what the Fed says banks worry about. He actually said, I couldn't care less. So, it, you know, it's based on LIBOR versus effective Fed funds, which frankly is inverted right now. So that's why the Fed has got that caught their attention more than the three-month, three 10-year. But bottom line is the 210 has yet to invert. Banks are still willing to lend. This is lending standards for large and small businesses. And, you know, so here, here's where we differentiate. The treasury market is telling you because the 10 years below the Fed funds, lower bound range, people would suggest that the treasury market is telling you a recession is coming. That makes sense to me, right? Because you had a drop from three and a quarter to under the Fed funds rate. That kind of makes sense, right? The only problem is that recessions don't just come from the treasury market. They come from all areas of credit. So what you need is a confirmation that the drop in treasury yields is, is happening at the same time as a significant worsening in non-treasury credit conditions, right? I just showed you the bank lending. They're still willing to lend. This is the LQD, which measures um, the 10 years on the top and the investment grade uh, ETF, the Barclays investment grade ETF is on the bottom. Um, actually, that's not true. It's, this is the um, high yield total return index is making a new high almost every day, right? So when you look at that against this next slide, which is the high, uh, the bottom half of this is high yield spreads against 10 year treasuries. With the 10 year treasuries going from three and a quarter to two, you've still narrowed the euchre or the, uh, the corporate spreads because there's been a rally in the high yield corporate bond market. This is the chart to focus on when people say the bond market is telling you something with treasuries. You got to define which bond market. This is the corporate yield, right? You cannot find a time where you've had a massive recession when, or any recession when the corporate yields were coming down. High yield debt, what creates the widening is you get a flight to safety in the treasuries and a massive selling in corporates. And then let's say everything I've said is different this time because of the zero interest rate policy or the lower risk premium and all that other fun stuff. So this is my checks and balances. This is the national financial condition sub indices from the Chicago Fed. All right. These, this is basically telling you that there's no stress being priced into credit. This, these three spaghetti lines measure 105 indicators in credit stress, right? Typically, even, even if you look back at 95, it was way worse than this and, and, a, and a couple of them. The, the truth is you're near a cycle and historic low, the lowest level in decades for, for the risk um, parameter on this. It's hard to have a recession if there's no credit stress. It's a credit-driven economy, 
and this is just technical analysis of fundamental data. No matter how you slice that, that's a downtrend. But because it's you know credit and everybody worries about the bubble, they'd say that credit's gonna be stressed, which has been the case since 2012. More people have been saying that. So here, what I think is happening economically is if you look on this chart, the blue histogram is the real D GDP, quarterly annualized GDP. When you look at the right side, there's been no recession in 10 years, we know that. What I wanna do is point you to the left side. When you look at that blue histogram, from 1949 to 1960, you've had, you had four recessions. The market went up nearly 400% during that period. Four recessions all had basically your median decline for those four recessions in the S&P uh, was 21%. Okay, seems pretty normal, right? I would posit to you that we've had three recessions this cycle that aren't official recessions, but pretty damn close, associated with near 20% drop. You had the 2011-12 European debt crisis, which had a 19.6% drop in the S&P 500. Call me crazy, I'm gonna call that 20% because the TV doesn't wanna actually market as, as a bear market, whatever. 19.6 is 20. 2015-16, we all know about the internal bear market in that industrial global recession when oil prices, collapsed from 125 to 26. We remember that. That was clearly a global commodity crisis driven uh, semi-recession. And then you've got, um, most recently, you got the current time where the global PMIs and all the uh, various commodities and everything else has been under pressure, I think. Plus you had a 19.8% drop in December by December of last year. Call me crazy again. What if we're actually six months into a new bull market versus being 10 years into a bull market. That would kind of shake up what expectations are. And how do you know if that's true or not? Because you got a volume thrust that Tom, uh, Tom McClellan did a good job. So many people did a good job of identifying, um, including us, frankly, in February, where you got this breadth thrust off the low that is usually indicative of forward gains not being at the end of a cycle. Couple that with my friends at the Lowry Service, um, which they put out great stuff on operating company only AD lines and all the other fun stuff that we like to look at. I can't find anything that's not confirming the recent new highs in the S&P 500. And people would say, but the trannies and transportations and the, um, the transportation stocks and the small cap stocks are underperforming. Exactly what happened in 1995. And if you look at the transportation stocks, pull up a chart of Transportation stocks against the S&P, they also significantly underperformed the new high in both two and twice already this cycle. I think it was 2012 and 2017, or 2016 or 17. But just look at a chart, you'll see it. All right, small business optimism remains high. It's kind of churning around waiting to find out what we do with the trade war. Consumer confidence is coming off peak. Also waiting kind of to see what, what's going on with the trade war. Um, we still have the demographic tailwind. The millennial demographic is turning 30 in 1990 or in 2020. They've had 10 years of employment, 10 years of market gains, 10 years of, uh, of income verification. They can buy a house. Um, that is beginning to happen as your home ownership rate on the bottom is trending higher as your homeowner vacancy rate is trending lower. So, you know, we're in this situation where we think there's a fundamental story that could be made. Yes, there's been this massive slowdown since the peak in the global economy since the peak of 2017 in November. Well, you know, we think that the lower interest rate regime in the last six months is going to turn it the other way as we move into next year and that we've already been in a mini recession. This is the unemployment rate still at a generational low. It's hard to have, this chart is household debt service ratio. It's hard to have a household credit crisis if you can still afford your debt. People love to talk about higher rates. They always forget to talk about the higher incomes and the jobless uh, and the job activity that allows you to afford more debt. Okay, so uh, quickly just want to uh, point to a couple of slides on the global economy. This is the breadth of the purchasing managers indices globally. And it's the share of the PMIs showing positive year-to-year -year changes. We're bouncing. We've been kind of bouncing off the low, just like we inflected from the peak at the end of, at the end of 2017. We're doing the opposite today. 
So the share of the PMI new exports orders posting positive year to year changes. I am not telling you the global economy is good. It is not. I'm telling you that you're seeing signs of an inflection off of a very low level. That's confirmed by the OECD composite leading indicators, which suggest that um, you, so that blue line, which is what everybody talks about, um, this measures 36 economy globe, economies globally. It's the oldest um, data series you can get in composite leading indicators for global economies. That blue line is near a historic low. What I'm pointing to is the black line, which is the month to month change, is what drives the year to year change on the red line, which ultimately drives the blue line. And you can see that they're all inflecting. So the narrative that I would use is where I've been wrong this cycle is I've underestimated the hit that the market takes on what these little mini recessions or soft recessions that don't get declared, the impact that they have on the markets. I'll try not to make that mistake the next time rates go up again, because it'll do the same thing. And you know, when you think about how rates affect the economy today and why we haven't had a more important recession, um, think about it as bumper bowling. Most people know what bumper bowling is, right? Bumper bowling, higher rates, maybe three and a quarter percent in the 10 year, it, backs you down, you know, slows the economy down. That's the left bumper. And on the right bumper of the bumper bowling, you got 2% or under in the 10 year, which picks activity in the refi and, and housing market up. So we're kind of in this period where the amount of debt has created a, you know, a soft gain and a soft landing each time when it gets to an extreme. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, that's what we're kind of seeing globally. Um, earnings, we're going into earnings season. The current expectations are for uh, not Q219, according to IBIS from Re Refinitiv. Um, you expect them consensus expectations for a drop of one tenth of one percent. What I like to remember is that this cycle from the beginning of the quarterly earnings season, which would be obviously um, July 1, it really kicks off next week with the big banks. Um, you get a median three and a half percent gain. You've never not had a gain this cycle in the estimate for earnings from the beginning to the end of reporting season. So if you take the median, we're probably going to be closer to 4% than zero when it comes to earnings growth. Certainly we should, it would be almost, it would be historically unique to be negative. So um, with, oh, one more slide before I open it up. Okay, this is our call for next year is for S&P. Frankly, our call this year was 29.50. We hit it, obviously. Rather than trying, you know, just make a six-month guess on valuation, which doesn't work, it's just a guess. We're focused on our next year target of 33.50, which is based on a 19 multiple and 176 in earnings. I say a 19 multiple because that's historically what the market multiple trades at when core inflation is between one and 3%. We don't have to go to a long history to find that. We just have to look at 2016 through 2018 where your average multiple was 19 times. So um, we're at 19 times, 176, 33.50, and we would buy weakness until uh, rates go significantly higher. Wow. It was, uh, it was an excellent presentation. There are a couple questions in the room, so I thought I'd pass those on to you. Please. Um, one, how do you measure product productivity? It's uh, output per unit of labor, which is put out by the government. Okay. Next question. How does the growing national debt affect uh, the Fed's um, maneuvering with interest rates, you know, the Fed funds rate? How When you look at growing national debt, and I think you talked about that earlier, you know, the, the, the debt keeps growing and growing. Yep. At what at what point is it a problem for you? Is there a signal that that triggers, and and how what's the impact on uh, interest rates? So the debt, the national debt, has been a reason for people to be bearish since I got into this business in May of 1987. That was what made Greenspan so concerned um, about inflation because if rates go significantly higher, you're not going to be able to afford the interest payments on that debt. We're all familiar with the chart of interest payments to um, to debt by the government. And it's kind of been a flat line at a very historically low level, but the dotted lines of where it's going to be is always up and to the right. Cause there's this assumption that there's going to be this huge inflation uptick because of the liquidity that's going to cause interest rates to go nuts and not able to afford the debt, right? That's the narrative. The problem is the amount of debt. And as soon as those interest rates go up, 
it slows the economy down to limit inflationary pressures. So it's actually counterintuitive where the increase in the level of debt has caused less inflation naturally because you can't, you can't get the kind of growth rate you need because you can't afford the interest expense. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Well, those were the two questions out of the uh, room. Um, you, you mentioned Marty Zweig earlier. And yep. uh, do you know the name Norman Fosbeck? Yep. Um, okay. Well, I've, you know, followed, um, you know, the history of the S&P 500. I go back to 1950. I've got a daily uh, spreadsheet. I mean, it's like the spreadsheet of all spreadsheets. But you mentioned, you know, that you thought that perhaps we could have a little pullback. And I was just wondering if you were aware that from July 17th at the close through September 27th at the close, the S&P 500 over those days since 1950, and we're talking about like 3,500 trading days. If you go back, you know, you take those two months and 10 days and go back six or 70 years. Yeah. Um, that period has produced an annualized return of minus 2.16%. You might think, well, that's not really much, but when the S&P is averaged going up about 9% a year for those 70 years, that's 11 percentage points of underperformance during the summer. Do you pay attention at all to the seasonal patterns like that? I don't because active managers aren't driving it. Okay. Like if you look at the last 15, 10 years, so if you do, you know, exponential versus simple moving average, right? Yep. You look at the most recent data, there's nothing to really support that claim. Um, now, you obviously, May was a bad month, but now, you, you know, t- turn around June and July, not. And I wrote a piece last year called Sell in May and Go Away, and it was not. So what drove that historically was active managers um, moving the market. The millennials who are in the target date funds that are putting all their money in uh, indices from that, they don't care what time of year it is. It just happens and happens and happens. So I think passive has affected that to some degree, and it's been a lot more random recently. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I'm not a fan of go away in May, and I've talked uh, a lot about that. I know small caps, Russell 2000 in particular, tend to do very well in the month of May and June um, historically, and so that would be one reason for sure to dispute it. But yeah, I'm not a, not a fan of that, but I, I just found it interesting. Cause I always, I look at July 17th to, to September 27th, a lot of folks on vacation. I just think that maybe less volume, there's a little bit more manipulation, but there's, I was curious whether or not you had any thoughts on that. You want, you want to hear kind of some, an interesting off the top of my head thought. Sure. We're at a new record high at 3000 on the S and P today, right? Yep. You know what that means? You should have never sold in the history of the market. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the only times you really, in my opinion, should get very negative is when you can prove to yourself that there's some driver that will take it down really hard. And that driver has to be an inversion of the 210 curve that shuts down the shadow bankers and causes companies to not have access to money. And that's when you get these massive drawdowns. But other than that, for the individual investor, it's really... You know, it's it's whether it's where you're more aggressive as a buyer, not where you should be a seller. Historically, it's just by definition of a new record high. Yeah, and I would I would go a step further and say, please, everybody listening to the show, please don't let the media be your driver. Yeah, for sure. Even though I'm in it, I have a very hard well, time. With well, I meant except you, Tony. <laughs> well, no, it's I mean, there's it, it drove me bananas yesterday when I'm listening to everybody talk about how the slowing earnings growth is next year is it this year and next year is going to cause the market to go down. You should, they should, I wish they would do the research just this cycle, 2013 and 2017. Guess what happened? The market expectations for earnings tanked. They tanked. Mm-hmm. I think it was over 10% both years. They were up 30% and 20% respectively. And you had a multiple expansion for both of them because interest rates had come down. Mm-hmm. That's, so the media, just be, you know, I always say to people, you know, find the people you like. That's nice. Even me, discount me. All right. Everybody's got a bias. Discount everybody and do your work. And if somebody says something, check it. Yep. Agreed. Totally. That was my rant of the day. All right. Well, this was another great uh, session. Uh, great insight. All right. And one last plug. Where do does, where does people go if they want to follow what you do? Uh, DwyerStrategy.com, where you get the vast majority of what I put out to uh, to the institutional guys. It, it's, I'm told, pretty inexpensive, and hopefully uh, you find some value there. 
appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your week. All right. Thanks for the plug. Have a great day, guys. All right. Thanks. All right. Dan.